everybody uh, welcome back to the channel today I'm going to do a book haul I didn't do one in August because I only bought four books so I thought it's not a point however I bought a lot in September so there's rather a lot to get through so let's do it so in August I bought The House Made by Frieda McFadden this is the works three for six so the next two you'll be seeing were from the same deal um, so I've not read this I know a lot of people love this <clears throat> if you haven't read it goes like this every day I clean the Winchester's beautiful house I collect their daughter from school and I cook a delicious meal for the whole family before heading up to eat alone in my tiny room on the top floor I try to ignore how Nina Winchester makes a mess just to watch me clean it up how she tells strange lies about her own daughter and how her husband seems more broken every day but it's hard not to imagine what it'd be like to live Nina's life the walk-in closet fancy car and the perfect husband I only try on one of Nina's pristine white dresses once, but she soon finds out. And by the time I realise my bedroom door only locks from the outside, it's far too late. But the Winchesters don't know who I really am. They don't know what I'm capable of. So, oh, sounds good. Some, sounds all right. I have heard good things about that. I've heard, <coughs> excuse me, lots of good things about the third one. But I haven't got that one. But I did get the second one. The Housemaid's a Secret. So this one is, it's hard to find an employer who doesn't ask too many questions about my past. So I thank my lucky stars that, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so I thank my lucky stars that Douglas Garrick and his wife miraculously give me a job cleaning their stunning penthouse with views across the city and preparing fancy meals in their shiny kitchen. I can work here for a while, stay quiet until I get what I want. Ooh. It's almost perfect, but I still haven't met Mrs. Garrick or seen inside the guest bedroom. I'm sure I hear her crying. I notice spots of blood around the neck of her white nightgowns when I'm doing laundry. And one day I can't help but knock on the door. When it gently swings open, what I see inside changes everything. Douglas Garrick has done one wrong. He is going to pay. It's simply a question of how far I'm willing to go. Oh, I like the sound of that one. I'm just trying to get the camera right, that's better. And then they didn't have the third one. They've got it now, they didn't have it when I bought it, but I did get uh, Never Lie. So newlyweds Trisha and Ethan are searching for the house of their dreams. They think they found it when they visit the remote manor that once belonged to Dr. Adrian Hale, a renowned psychiatrist who vanished without a trace years ago. But when a violent winter storm traps them at the estate, the house begins to lose its appeal. Stuck inside and growing restless, Trisha stumbles on a collection of audio transcripts from Dr. Hale sessions with patients. As Trisha, Trisha listens to the cassette tape, she learns about the terrifying chain of events leading up to the Doctor's mysterious disappearance. With each tape, another shocking piece of the puzzle falls into place, and a web of lies slowly unravels. Ooh. But by the time Trisha reaches the final cassette, the one that reveals the entire horrifying story, it will be too late. Oh! Another sounding good one. And then the fourth book I bought in August, I actually got on holiday in the charity shop, one of the charity shops there, and it's the hardback edition of Stephen King's You Like It Darker, which is his new book. Now, you know, I collect Stephen King's in paperback, but if I see a hardback that's cheap, I'm not passing it up. This was £1.99. It literally came out this year. So this is a classic collection of short stories that he's written. I have to open it up because there's the blurbs on, from other people on the back rather than the actual story. So, you like it darker? Fine, so do I, writes Stephen King in the afterword to this magnificent new collection of 12 stories that delve into the darker part of life, both metaphorical and literal. So it says, readers will feel that exhilaration too. In Two Talented Bastards explores the long hidden secret of how the eponymous gentleman got their skills. In Danny Coughlin's Bad Dream, a brief and unprecedented psychic flash upends dozens of lies. Daddy's most catastrophically. In Rattlesnakes, a sequel to Cujo, a grieving widower travels to Florida for respite and instead receives an unexpected inheritance with major strings attached. In The Dreamers, a taciturn Vietnam vet answered a job ad and learns that there are some corners of the universe best left unexplored. The answer man asks if prescience, prescience is good, luck or bad, and reminds us that life marked by unbearable tragedy can still be meaningful. Um, the answer man was actually my favourite story in here. I have read this. Um, there are more stories than that, but those are the, the, the ones that I think that, have, that stand out uh, and that they mention in the jacket blurb. But yeah, this is really good. So, you like it darker? A bit of King. 
Okay, so you know how I like uh, old Hollywood. I went into my local charity shop and picked up Dietrich, a biography by Ian Wood. 50p. I'm certainly not leave, live in, leaving a hard work biography of one of the greatest stars who ever lived in my charity shop for 50p. So, Marlena, a woman image ink icon, astonishingly beautiful with finely modelled cheekbones, a broad smooth forehead, eyes that held a knowing tenderness and a mouth prone to cool mockery. Tailored to please, perfect from her trademark hairstyle to her elegant high heels, she made the women in her audience feel more glamorous, the men more dashing. She experienced more of life and love, more of rapture and loss than any woman who has ever lived since Cleopatra. From a traumatic Prussian childhood to the debauchery of Berlin, film success, stardom in 30s Hollywood and status as the highest paid woman in the world. Yet throughout she remained wry and detached, calculating, in control of her life and herself. So who was the woman behind the glittering image? Was she the passionate, disillusioned creature of the night that she seemed? Were her stage and film appearances mere artifice? Was she clever as well as talented? Was she capable of warmth and compassion? Who was Marlena Dietrich? So I have to say that I have a copy of her singing Bob Dylan's Blowing in the Wind. And it's fantastic. It's much better than Bob Dylan singing Blowing in the Wind. So that one um, I might read next month because obviously uh, next month is non-fiction November. I don't normally do it and I certainly don't do the tags uh, but I've got a couple of non-fiction books that I would like to partake of. There's another one coming up a bit later. Uh, so yeah, next one is called really good actually and this is by Monica Heisey like the orange uh, so this one says Maggie's marriage has ended just 608 days after it started but she's fine she's doing really good actually sure she's alone for the first time and can't afford a rent and her obscure PhD is going nowhere but at the age of 29 Maggie is determined to embrace her new status as a surprisingly young divorcee as Maggie throws herself headlong into the chaos of her first year of divorce, she soon finds herself questioning everything, including why do we still get married? Did I fail before I even got started? And how many 4am delivery burgers do I need to eat until I am happy? So that sounds all right. Again, most of these from the charity shop, either from uh, the one I normally go where everything's 50 pence or from charity shops in Newport because I did get a few, uh, including this one in, in those. I'm just going to have a sip of all, well, Pepsi. Dip a Pepsi Max to be precise. Hang on. Right. Okay. Sorry, just one sec. Right. And we have got The Girl in the Ice by Robert Brinzer. Her eyes are wide open, her lips parted as if to speak, her dead body frozen in the ice. She is not the only one. When a young boy discovers the body of a woman beneath a thick sheet of ice in a South London park, Detective Erica Foster is called in to lead the murder investigation. The victim, a beautiful young socialite, appeared to have the perfect life, yet when Erica begins to dig deeper, she starts to connect the dots between the murder and the killings of three prostitutes, all found strangled, hands bound and dumped in water around London. What dark secrets is the girl in the high ice hiding? As Erica inches closer to uncovering the truth, the killer is closing in on Erica, but she will she get to him before he strikes again? There you go. So I am picking up cheap books wherever I can. I did pick up um, the strike novel, Troubled Blood, which is obviously JK Rowling or Robert Galbraith as she writes under, um, because it was uh, second hand and it's in almost perfect condition. So I thought that way I can read it. And I do like the series. I've watched the series. I haven't actually read any of the books. I've got three of them now, I haven't read any of them. Oops. Uh, Private Detective Cormoran Strike is visiting his family, and I remember this story, it's a good one, in Cornwall when he's approached by a woman asking for help finding her mother, Margaret Bambra, who went missing in mysterious circumstances in 1974. Strike has never tackled a cold case before, but intrigued he takes it on, adding to the long list of cases that he and his partner in the agency, Robert Robin Ellicott, are currently investigating. Plus, the pair are still battling their feelings for one another, while Robin is also juggling a messy divorce and unwanted male attention. They should have just got together in the first place. They haven't, as far as I know, but then I haven't read all the books. At all. Any of them. Strike and Robin soon find themselves up against a fiendishly complex case with leads that include tarot cards, a psychopathic serial killer and witnesses who cannot all be trusted and they learn that even cases decades old can prove to be deadly. 
So eventually I'll get to that when I've got all the rest of them and I've read the first two, which I've actually got the first one. <laughs> I know I've got like, what, like, I don't know. Um, I did find also in same charity shop, The Inmate by Freedom McFadden. <laughs> got a lot of Freedom McFadden to get through, so. As a new nurse practitioner at Maxim Security Prison, Brooke Sullivan is taught three crucial rules. One, treat all prisoners with respect. Two, never reveal any personal information. Three, never ever become too friendly with the inmates. But nobody knows that Brooke has already broken the rules. Nobody knows about her intimate connection to Shane Nelson, one of the penitentiary's most notorious and dangerous inmates. They certainly don't know that Shane was Brooke's high school sweetheart, the star quarterback, the golden boy who's serving a life sentence for a series of grisly murders, or that Brooke's testimony was what put him there. But Shane knows. He knows more than anyone, and he will never forget. Woo, sounds scary. That one actually does sound scary. And then I got another Meet Freedom McFadden. They did have, never lie, but I already got that one. But they did have the locked door, so I picked that one up as well. Some doors are locked for a reason. Well, 11-year-old Nora Davis was up in her bedroom doing homework. She had no idea her father was killing a woman in the basement. Lovely. Until the day the police arrived at their front door. Decades later, Nora's father is spending his life behind bars and Nora is a successful surgeon with a quiet, solitary existence. Nobody knows about her past and she'll do anything to keep it that way. Then one of her young female patients is murdered, killed in the same unique and horrific manner that her father used to kill his victims. Somebody, know who's so, bleh, somebody knows who Nora is. Somebody wants her to take the fall for this unthinkable crime. But she's not like her father. The police can't pin anything on her as long as they don't look in her basement. Ooh. Uh, another non-fiction, maybe for non-fiction December, no, no, November, I can't even speak today, is The Life and Crimes of Agatha Christie. This is an autobiography by Charles Osborne. As you know, I just not long finished the Complete Secret Network books, so I thought I'd, this was in the charity shop, I'm not going to leave it there, am I? A shy retiring woman who began to write in order to avoid having to talk to people. Sounds like a good reason to me. Agatha Christie produced her first detective novel, novel at the age of 26 on a dare from her sister. She went on to author 78 crime novels and short story collections that have sold over 2 billion copies in more than 100 languages, making her the best-selling author of all time, as this was printed. Shakespeare is second. Published in commemoration with the 100th anniversary of her birth, The Life and Crimes of Agatha Christie is a comprehensive, fully illustrated guide to the life work of this remarkable woman and an in-depth portrait of the world in which she lived. In this insightful biography, acclaimed author Charles Osborne examines not only Christie's numerous murder mysteries and crime thrillers, but also her plays, poetry, non-fiction stories for children, the films based on her works, which are still being made to this day, obviously, and the six semi-autographable semi-autobiographical romantic novels that she wrote under the pseudonym Mary Westmacott. Oswin also explores the creation of Christie's much-loved sleuth, the egotistical and eccentric Hercule Poirot and the shrewd spinster Miss Jane Marple. From classics of detection like Murder on the Orient Express, Ten Little Indians, which is now called, and then they went on, because it had a different name before that which was even worse, so you can tell how old this is, and her record-breaking play, The Mousetrap, to her mysterious 1926 disappearance in her life in the Middle East as an assistant to her archaeologist husband. This fascinating and authoritative bi biography reveals the life and work of the woman who ushered in the golden age of crime fiction and who remains the most world's most popular mystery writer. So this would have been originally published... Nineteen ninety? Yeah, nineteen ninety. So obviously yeah, things have changed since the nineties. Um I also bought and I will probably be reading it this month because it is October and I'm reading spooky stories as much as I can. Um so far I've read finished three books. But they were all on the Kindle and I am reading Christina Henry's The House of Horror Built at the moment. There's a lot of Stephen King I'm going to be reading and listening to. Um, but I did find a copy of The Dark Half, again in hardback. You know I prefer the paperbacks, but they all look nice on my shelf. <laughs> but this was £5 in a shop I've been going to for 30 odd years. Paul Trantmark in Newport used to be in New Indoor Market. It's now outside. He is shutting the store down before Christmas. 
because he decided he had enough. He'd, he'd been ill. He came back, he was fine, and then he got sick again. And the next time he came back, he was like, I just don't want to do this anymore. So that's the time. You know it's right to stop. If you suddenly feel, I don't want to do this anymore, you, you stop. So he, he, he could have just closed and walked away, but he decided not to. He decided, I'm going to stay open, sell off as much as I can, and obviously see the people who have been my regulars. So obviously I bought my first Judy Garden LP from Troutmark back in 1990, around then, which was the um, Carnegie Hall LP. Still got it, still plays fine. Even though I've got it on CD now, I still play the LB, LP when I want to. Um, I've bought books there, I've sold books through him, I've sold books to him as well. But yeah, so I'm very sad he's closing, but I understand his reasons. I'm hoping to get down there uh, another Saturday and hopefully see him again. So I can, you know, because he's got DVDs that I, you know, like old movies and stuff. I'll pick a few of them up if I can. And books. And I spotted this and I thought, I've got to have it, I've got to have it. There was only a fiver. This is a first American printing of the dark half, which I have not read. Uh, when Thad Beaumont wakes to the nightmare of George Stark, he hears birds, thousands are all cheaping and twittering at the same time. And with the sound comes a presentment full of memory and foreboding. The sparrows are flying again. Thad Beaumont is a writer and for a dozen years he secretly published novels under the name of George Stark because he was no longer able to write under his own name. He even invented a slightly sinister author biography to satisfy the many fans of Stark's violent bestsellers. But Thad is healthier and happier man now, the father of infant twins and starting to write as himself again. He no longer needs George Stark and in fact has good reason to lay Stark to rest. So with nationwide publicity, a bit of guilt and a good deal of relief, the pseudonym is retired. In the small town of Castle Rock, Maine, where Thad and Liz keep a summer home, Sheriff Alan Pangborn ponders the brutal roadside murder of a man named Homer Gamash. When Homer's pickup truck is found, the bloody fingerprints of the perpetrator are all over. They match Thad Beaumont's exactly. Armed with hard evidence, Pangborn pays the Beaumonts a visit, and suddenly he too is thrust into a dream so bizarre that neither he, criminal science, nor his own sharp mind can make sense of it. I feel a bit, I'm a bit low. Hang on. That's better. <laughs> uh, at the centre of the nightmare is the devastating figure of George Stark, Thad Bowman's dark half, impossibly alive and relentlessly on the loose, a killing machine that destroys everyone on, in, on the path that leads to the man who created him. As Thad and Liz contend with this escalating horror and implacable threat of existence and Thad reaches deep inside his own mind to mount a defence, forces gather in the air above Castle Lake, outriders of the dead to the land of the living. To whom do they belong? Here is the dark half. A tale of terror so real and fascinating that Stephen King's growing legion of fans will find themselves squirming in the masses, heart stopping, blood curdling rip. Loving every minute of it. So. That's one for this month, so when I put my books away, that will be staying in here and going on my TBR shelf. This I, no, My TBR shelf's actually full. I'm going to have to move stuff around again. So, there we go. Pop that over there. Uh, another non-fiction I bought that I'll probably tie and attack next month is Sully, Miracle on the Hudson, previously published as Highest Duty, written by Chelsea B. Sully Sullenberger III with Jeffrey Zaslow. Now, I love the movie, if you've seen it, Miracle on the Hudson. I've got it on DVD and obviously it's Tom Hanks in the movie. Um, I want my mum to see it. I think she'd enjoy it. It's a really good movie. So, and I remember this happening. I think that's probably why I'm so fascinated with it. I'm fascinated with aviation anyway. Um, I love flying. Um, there is a YouTube channel called Green Dot Aviation and I actually adore that channel. Go check it out. Um, just be aware that he does deal with air accidents. So it can be quite, not always, some of the near misses, but there are obviously a lot where planes have crashed. Um, and he's done one on Malaysian plane, is it MH130? Um, long one on that. Um, but he, he himself is uh, undergoing pilot training. He is absolutely brilliant. Green Dot Aviation is one of my favourite channels. I've actually watched all his back catalogue now. I'm waiting for a new one. Obviously they take a lot of time to research and put together. But if you're interested in aviation and it doesn't scare you to watch uh, documentaries about planes crashing, it doesn't mean it doesn't bother me at all, um, go ahead and watch it. But I actually remember this when it happened back in, what was it, 2009? I remember this and I remember thinking, oh my God. 
So on January 15th, 2009, the world witnessed a remarkable emergency landing when Captain Sully Sullenberger skillfully glided US Airways Flight 1549 onto the Hudson River, saving the lives of all 155 passengers and crew. His cool actions not only averted tragedy, but made him a hero and an inspiration worldwide. His story is now a major motion picture from director, producer Clint Eastwood and stars Tom Hanks, Aaron Eckhart and Lauren Linney. So, yeah, I mean, I love the film, so it'd be quite interesting to actually read the book. Yeah. So, why not? It was 25 pence in my local charity shop. I'm not saying no. <laughs> okay. uh, Debbie McCumber. I've never read any Debbie McCumber, believe it or not. I don't think so. It's a floppy one. Uh, this is... 16 Lighthouse Road. I thought I'd pick it. It looks interesting. This is something my mum would probably like, I think. Uh, Judge Olivia Lockhart has caused a scandal. Hearing Cecilia and Ian Randall's petition for divorce, she came to the conclusion that the young couple hadn't tried hard enough to make their marriage work. Her judgment, divorce denied. While Judge Olivia throws the town into an uproar, her daughter Justine is on the verge of the biggest decision of her life. Should she stop waiting for love and accept a marriage of convenience? Olivia's best friend, Grace, has troubles of her own. Dan, her husband, is increasingly distant and Grace is starting to wonder if he's having an affair. And in Cedar Cove, nothing stays secret for long. So it sounds alright, actually. I'll probably enjoy that one once I get through horror, horror month. Uh, next we've got Just Just Got Real by Jane Fallon. I love the fact I can pick all these books up really cheap from uh, various charity shops. Charity shops are my favourite for buying books. And I do get some from eBay, there's a couple coming up in a bit. But yeah, oh gosh, yes. I'm terrible, I should not be allowed out. My TBR is at about 526 now, I want to say. My physical one. We're not even looking at the... Uh, Kindle one because it just sits there and I just read them as and when. Although my mum's got my Kindle at the moment. Um, when happily divorced jo Joni finds Ant via a dating app, neither is entirely honest about who they are. But when they meet in real life, they fall for each other. Soon they are a happy, steady item until Joni discovers Ant is still on the app, still dating other women. Having secret rivals devastates Joni, so she decides to take revenge, but not on them. Can, can she turn these rivals into allies? To get back at the real enemy, Ant. See, that sounds like my kind of uh, book. Uh, one that might get read this month. Um, it's a, a, one that's quite a, a murder mystery. Is Lucy Foley's The Hunting Party. I like Lucy Foley. Love the Paris apartment. Really love the guest list. So I'm hoping this is going to do it as well. Yes. In a remote hunting lodge deep in the Scottish wilderness, old friends gather for New Year. The beautiful one. The gold couple, the volatile one, the new parents, the quiet one, the city boy, the outsider, the victim. Not an accident, a murder among friends. I like the way that they do the blurb for the Lucy Foley books, so just a list of people and who they are. I really like that, it's so different. So yeah, keep going. Excuse me, it's slurping my Coca-Cola. Well, well, it's not Coca-Cola, it's Pepsi Max. My phone's playing up, sorry. There we go. Next one for Christmas, I have a shelf on my bookcase of TBR where I've got all my Christmassy books together with Christmas or Winter in the title or a set around that time, ready for the 1st of December because every December I try and read everything with Christmas related. So October is horror, November is non-fiction and December is Christmas. And this is Penelo Pe Pe sorry, Penny Parks Snowed In at the Practice. I'm assuming it's a doctor's practice. Welcome to Larkford Surgery in the Cotswolds, lovely place. The heart of a tight-knit community and a hotbed of drama, rivalry and romance. And that's just the doctors. Dr Holly Graham is contemplating a return to work after maternity leave. Even with husband Dr Taffy Jones and devoted friend Elsie by her side, with two sets of twins to look after, life is utter chaos. Stepping back into her professional role will be no easy feat, until an unexpected offer changes everything. At Larkford Surgery, Dr Alice Walker's canine clinic with Coco, her assistant's dog, has been a storming success. If only she and her best friend Dr Tilly Granger in from South America to join the team, had proved so straightforward. It seems that Tilly isn't finding life in the peaceful Cotswolds as, as, re as rewarding as she had hoped, and she's causing chaos. Join the residents of Larkford for a festive fling as the snow falls, secrets are revealed and romance blossoms. There you go. One for the Christmas shelf. Another one I picked up in Troutmark was literally a pound and 
It's The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carl McCullers. And this lovely pocket penguin, orange. And Mark, who owns Stratmark, uh, said it's one of the best novels he's ever read. And I take his stuff for anything he says seriously. He's a lot older than me. Um, well, probably not that much older than me, but he is, obviously, because he's been running the business for years. Um, and, um, but yeah, so it's um, a story of an isolated, lost lives inter intersecting in small town America in the American South. A masterpiece of humane sensitivity so I'm looking forward to that one another horror book so it will be read hopefully this month is Possession by Peter James we all know Peter James is the author of the, the Roy Grace series that have dead in the title there's two of those out I haven't got this year which is the one about Sandy and the new Grace one itself if it's out yeah I don't know I'm hopefully getting them on Christmas along with the, the new Richard Osman we solve murders that's it I collect those authors. I love Richard Osmond as well. Um, but Peter James, before he started writing Roy Grace and the Mysteries as much, wrote a lot of horror to the point that he was actually called Britain's Answer to Stephen King. Now, I don't think they're all that terrifying. Prophecy was pretty, pretty scared me the first time I read it. Um, this one I've read a, a long, long time ago, so I'm looking forward to a reread of this in... Um... Oh this month and there, is, there he is looking all young on the back if you can see I don't know it's not going to focus so Possession this was an eBay purchase I buy all these hardback second hand the only ones I'm having trouble to get in I think will be the first three he wrote they one I can't find though I do know it's in hardback because somebody showed it to him not long ago and the other two is like £69 a piece and I can't afford it so I might have to just forego those three for now. Anyway, after Fabian Hightower is killed in a car crash, his mother Alex, an attractive and successful businesswoman, woman starts to have a series of increasingly terrifying psychic experiences. Recently separated from her husband, she lives alone, surrounded by reminders of Fabian, a portrait, a gift of red roses sent before he died. She consults a medium only to have the medium stop in mid-session and refuse to continue. Terrified of something but will not reveal what. Alex becomes desperate. She is now haunted by Fabian at every turn by his pleas of help me mother. She begins to look into his past life realising how little she knew her strange and beautiful son. What she finds out at first worries her and then sickens her. The more she uncovers the more she realises her safety and even her life are in jeopardy. Somehow she knows she has to free herself from Fabian's spirit and from the cunning and evil that she is only beginning to understand. And then it says, widely researched and horrifically convincing, Possession introduces a startling new talent to the field of supernatural fiction. I think this might have been the first one. Yeah. Yeah, three thrillers. And this was his first horror story, so. I like the cover though, it's a really good cover. I read them in paperback years and years ago. Uh, then I did buy a couple of books in the works. With my mum being in hospital, I'm doing a lot of walking. And not that I, excuse, not that I get time to read when I'm walking, but um, and I have to walk from the hospital to the bus stop. I, I don't drive in because there's never any parking at the <coughs> hospital, which is. There is on a Sunday, so tomorrow, I feel this on Saturday, I'm, I'll go in and see her and I'll drive. But in the week, I catch the bus. It's just It's just... A nightmare. So I catch the bus to the hospital and then I walk from the hospital to the bus station and it's a good good mile and a half walk and I have to go past Waterstones and I have to go past the works. So I popped into Waterstones because I just wanted to have a look and I thought I'm gonna just get myself one book. So I bought two but one was free because I had enough points on my my Waterstones card. So I bought The Birds and Other Stories by Daphne de Maurier this is the VMC edition, vintage something it stands for, vintage modern classics, oh Virago modern classics, um, so the, the birds, short stories, how long he fought with them in the darkness he could not tell but at last the beating of the wings about him lessened and then withdrew. Classic alienation and horror. The Birds was immortalised by Hitchcock in his celebrated film. I have actually seen that film. 
The five other chilling stories in this collection echo a sense of dislocation and mock man's sense of dominance over the natural world. The mountain paradise on Monte Ferrita promises immortality but a terrible price. A ne neglected wife haunts her husband in the form of an apple tree. A photographer steps out from behind the camera and into his subject's life. A date with the cinema usherette leads to, leads to a walk in the cemetery and a jealous father finds remedy when three is a crowd. So again because these are chillingly supernaturally scary stories I'm going to try and get to this book this month and then I picked up Lisa Jewell no this is true I love Lisa Jewell she's one of my favorites I'm not gonna lie absolutely adore her so um Alex Summer and Josie Fair two very different women who meet by chance in a restaurant and discover they are birthday twins a few days later they meet again Alex is a podcaster and Josie persuades her to feature her on her new series. She tells Alex, she is, she tells Alex, on the cusp of great changes in her life. Alex agrees to do a trial interview with Josie. Josie's past appears to be strange and complicated, but although Alex finds her unsettling, she can't quite resist the temptation to keep digging and to keep recording. It soon becomes apparent that Josie has been hiding in some very dark secrets, and before Alex knows it, Josie has invested in inveigled her way into Alex's life and into her home which is when Alex realises that she and her family are in more danger than she ever thought possible so, yeah I do like a Lisa Jewel so I'm looking forward to that another one for this month Holly by Stephen King I did have this paperback on pre-order and now I have it oh, the smell of a new paperback Oh, they should bottle it and sell it as perfume. Anyway, I have been waiting so long for this to come out in paperback. Holly Gibney of Finders Keepers Detective Agency is meant to be on leave, but she finds it impossible to turn down Bonnie's mother's desperate request for help because Bonnie Dahl is missing. I missed that bit at the top. Then she discovers a single earring close to the location of Bonnie's abandoned bike. Mere blocks from where Bonnie Dahl disappeared lives Professors Rodney and Emily Harris. They are the picture of bourgeois respectability, a semi-retired lifelong academics, but they are harbouring a savage secret in the basement of their book-lined home. It's going to be a creepy old month, isn't it? Um, this is damp, and I don't know why, but never mind. Uh, this is a Folio Society edition I got from ebay because i have i mean again i go on there and i pick up something and this is w somerset morn's short stories so it's got the um very well known short story rain uh i'm not going to read anything about it because i don't i don't know anything about it so i wanted to read some more i've been in morn because uh, he did plays as well um but i do like an old uh folio society so yeah i don't know why it's a bit damp that's not a problem. It's probably had something spilled on it because. Anyway, back to the books because we have still got a stack here. Uh, a Shot in the Dark by Lynn Truss. Again, this was one from the charity shop. Brighton, 1957. Inspector Stein rather enjoys his life as a policeman by the sea. No criminals, no crime, no stress. He hasn't met Grace, has he? Because Grace is in Brighton. Mind you, Grace would be a child when this is good. But, you know, no murders in Brighton. Tell that to Roy. <laughs> so it's really rather annoying when an ambitious not to mention irritating new constable shows up to work and starts investigating a series of burglaries and it's even more annoying when after constable twitten is dispatched to the theater for the night he sits next to a vicious theater cricket critic who was promptly shot dead part way through the opening night of a new play it seems brighton may be in need of a police force after all sounds all right to me <laughs> Um, another one for the Christmas collection is Snowfall Over Hazelmill House by Suzanne Snow. <clears throat> we should have a sip and all. Okay. Uh, welcome to Hazelmill House, where romance might be just around the corner. After years of living in the past, Ella is ready to start building a future. The perfect opportunity presents itself when she's offered a short-term role at Hazelmill House in the Lake District and tasked with kickstarting its artist residence. She can explore a new career in an inspiring location. 
When Ella arrives at Hazelmere House, she wonders if she's made a huge mistake after she clashes with Max, the owner. Max has his own reasons to be unsettled by Ella's presence, but despite his misgivings, it seems everyone else loves having Ella around. As a single dad, it is children's attachment to her that bothers him. Who will pick up the pieces when Ella leaves? What Max doesn't know is that Ella is falling more than just for the beautiful place, including the people in it. Can a temporary job lead to a permanent happy ending? A tender and an uplifting Christmas read. So that goes on my Christmas shelf. Another non-fiction book I've wanted to read for ages I found in the PDSA charity shop in Newport. Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. This is one for non-fiction November. Or one Sorry, it stops automatically at 30 minutes. I've wanted to read this for so long, so I'm glad I got this. Um, so it says, a natural born killer with a dreamer's gaze and a tattooed blue eyed blonde boy. They killed and killed till the whole house was dead. Agent Al Dewey of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation has a crime to solve, a horrific crime, the cool slaughter of an entire family of God-fearing farming folk, blow blood and hair all over the walls and only a few dollars missing. All Agent Dewey has are two footprints, four dead bodies and a whole lot of questions, none with easy answers. Truman Capote's brilliant re reconstruction of the events and consequences of that murderous November night in 1959 is a superb and gripping mix of journalistic skill and sheer imaginative power. So it is non-fiction mixed with obviously a bit of imagination, but it is true. Um, Truman Capote, this is the, the book he's famous for, along with the short story Breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, two different stories you can get, could you really? Two different, completely different stories. Uh, but yes, so I have wanted to read this for a while. Um, so I grabbed it. We are getting near the end. We are on the last stack. Then we've got uh, Casey Casty, The Chocolate Box Girls, Summer's Dream. Each sister has a different story to tell, which one will be your favourite? Summer has always dreamed of dancing and when a place at ballet school comes up she wants it so badly it hurts. Middle school ends and the holidays begin but unlike her sisters, Summer has no time for lazy days and sunny beach parties. The audition becomes her obsession and things start spiralling out of control. The more Summer tries to find perfection, the more lost she becomes. Will she realise with the help of the boy who wants more than friendship that dreams come in all say itself, shapes and sizes? So this is like a, a middle grade to... YA middle grade I would say which is kind of you know it's, it's, it's for kids young you know teenagers but sometimes those are really nice books just to chill out to um and I like the idea of that somebody who wants to be a ballerina that's nice completely different now historical fiction which is not my usual favorite but this particular um genre of um, historical fiction if you want to call it that is because it's ancient Egyptian Cleopatra's Daughter by Michelle Moran at the dawn of the Roman Empire, when a tyranny ruled, a daughter of Egypt and a son of Rome found each other. Celine's legendary parents are gone, her country taken, she has been brought to the city of Rome in chains, with only her twin brother Alexander to remind her of home and all she once had. Living under the watchful eyes of the ruling family, Celine must quickly learn how to be Roman and how to be useful to Caesar. She puts her artistry to work in the hope of staying alive and being allowed to return to Egypt. Before long, however, she is distracted by the young and handsome heir to the empire. When the elusive Red Eagle starts calling for the end of slavery, Celine and Alexander are in grave danger. Will this mysterious figure bring their liberation or their demise? Ooh. That is the sort of historical fiction I get, I get to because I love anything to do with ancient Egypt. It's something you know about me. If you know me. If you know me, yeah. Those who know me, know me. I don't know. Kathy Wright, Bones to Ashes. I do love these. These are good stories. Under the microscope, the outer bone surface is a moonscape of craters. The skeleton is that of a young girl no more than 14 years old and forensic anthropologist Dr Temperance Brennan is struggling to keep her emotions in check. A nagging in her subconscious won't let up. A memory triggered deep in her hindbrain. The disappearance of a childhood friend. No warning, no explanation. Detective Andrew Ryan is working a series of parallel cases. Three missing persons, three unidentified bodies, all female. All early to mid-teens. Could Temp Skeleton be yet another in this tragic line of young victims? Or is she overreaching? Overreacting? Making connections where none exist? 
Working on instinct, Temp takes matters into her own hands, but even she could not have predicted the horrors this investigation would eventually uncover. Can Temp maintain a professional distance as the past catches up with her in this, her most deeply personal case yet? I love these stories. I mean, Temp Brennan is Kathy Reich's Scarpetta, which is Patricia Coleman. I like those as well. Got a few of those to read. Ah, another one, A Mystery for Christmas, The White Priory Murders by John Dixon Carr, writing as Carter Dixon. I love these little editions, they're gorgeous. Uh, let's have a look. James Bennett has been invited to stay at White Priory for Christmas. Among the retinue of the glamorous Hollywood actress, Marcia Tate, her producer, her lover, the playwright for her next hit, and her agent are all here, soon to become so many suspects when Tate is found murdered on a cold December morning in the lakeside pavilion. Only the footprints of her discoverer disturbed the snow which fell overnight and which stopped just shortly after Marcia was last seen alive. How did the murderer get in and out of the pavilion without leaving a trace? When Bennett's uncle, the cantankerous amateur sleuth Sir Henry Merivale, arrives from London to make sense of this impossible crime, the reader is treated to a feast of the author's trademark twists, beguiling false answers, and one of the most ingenious solutions in the history of the mystery genre. It's like a locked room mystery, isn't it? You know, where, you know how did they get away? How did they do it? And why is there no trace of them and things like that? Yes, I like that. And it's another one for the Christmas shelf. We got a Christmas mystery. Yeah. I got a Janice Halleck Christmas one, I'm sure I have. But it's not on the Christmas shelf, it's in the bottom of the box. I'll have to rescue it. Well, not yet, though. Uh, next, um, Sebastian Fawkes, Engleby. I'm sort of picking up Sebastian Fawkes as and when I see them, because I really like Birdsong. I'll read them sometime. Mike Engleby says things that others dare not even think. When the novel opens in the 1970s, a university student, having survived a traditional school, a man devoid of scruple or self-pity, Engleby provides a disarmingly frank account of English education. Yet beneath the disturbing surface, uh, surface of his observation lies an enfolding mystery of gripping power. One of his contemporaries unaccountably disappears, and as we follow Engleby's career, which brings us up to the present day, the reader has to ask, is Engleby capable of telling the whole truth? Mm. Excuse me. The last three are Marilyn related. So as you know, I love collecting Marilyn books. Um, two fiction, one non-fiction. I've got uh, James Elroy's The Enchanters. Um, <laughs> this one's going to be probably one that sits around for a long time before I get to read it because it's a murder theory book and I'm not big on James Elroy but I did want it for the collection. And it's also got my least favourite book ick. Deckled Edges! I hate deckled edges! I don't know why they just annoy me. I like a nice flat edge. But no, not only does he malign my Marilyn, he uses oops, <laughs> uh, deckled edges. So again, it's all blurb on the back from other people such as Time, Stephen King, uh, Joyce Carol Oates. Ugh, can't stand that woman. Sorry if you're a fan, but there you go. Uh, let's have a look. Los Angeles, August 4th, 1962. The city broils through a midsummer heat wave. Marilyn Monroe ODs. A B-movie starlet is kidnapped. The overhyped LAPD overreacts. Chief Bill Parker's looking for some get back. The Monroe deal looks like a moneymaker. He calls in Freddie O'Tash. The free and Freddie O, tainted ex-cop, defrock private eye, dope fiend and freelance extortionist, a man who lives by the maxim, opportunity is love, Freddie gets to work. He dimly perceives Marrow's death and the kidnapped starlet to be poisonous riddle that only he has the guts and the brains to untangle. We are with him as he tears through all those who block his path to the truth. We are with him as he penetrates the faux sunshine of Jack and Bobby Kennedy and the shock of Camelot. We are with him as he falters and grasps for love beyond opportunity. We are with him as he tracks Marilyn Monroe's horrific last to a nightmare LA that he served to create and his he confronts his complicity <coughs> and his own raging madness. It's the summer of 62 baby. Freddie O's got a hot date with history. The savage 60s are ready to pop. Now it does say in here it's a transcendent work of American popular fiction. The problem I have is that I, the only Elroy I've read is The Black Dahlia and I didn't really like that. It was all right. He writes about real people, but I think even if you're writing fictional about a real person, you've got to have some 
empathy and treat them with some kind of respect. Now I'm not saying that writing a story about Marilyn and the Kennedys fictionally is a bad idea because, you know, there are people who will take things like this as fact when it's not. We know that from the stupid book by Jules Asner, Whacked, that people take a page from it and think it's real. Um, it's another reason why I buy these and I do try and read them is just that I could say, well no, actually you've got that from this book, this is fiction. It's not, it's not fact. Um, but then there you go. I mean, it's a nice cover. I think the cover's really cool. So, but yeah, I, I will read it. I'll let you know what I think when I do get round to it. But there's a, let's just say it's not going to the top of the TBR pile. Now the next one's another fictional book. This is by Denise S. Bryce and Eliza Knight. And it's called Can't We Be Friends? And it's a novel of Ella Fitzgerald and Marilyn Monroe. Now there are issues with this as well, but I'm not going to worry too much about this. One woman was recognised as the premier singer of her era with perfect pitch and tireless ambition. One woman was the most glamorous star in Hollywood, a sex symbol who took the world by storm, and their friendship was fast and firm. In 1952, Ella Fitzgerald was a renowned jazz singer whose only roadblock to longevity is society's attitude towards women and race. Marilyn Monroe's star is rising despite ongoing battles with movie studios, bigwigs and boyfriends. When she needs help with her singing, she wants only the best, and the best is the brilliant Ella Fitzgerald. But Ella isn't a singing teacher, and she declines. Then the two women meet, and to everyone's surprise, but their own, they become fast friends. On the surface, what could they have had in common? Both women were underestimated by the men in their lives, husbands, managers, hangers-on, and both were determined to gain. Each fought professional independence and personal agency at a time when women were expected to surrender control to those same men. This novel reveals and celebrates their surprising bond over a decade and serves as a poignant reminder of how true friendship can cross differences to bolster and sustain us through haunted heartbreak and wild success. So, yeah, they were friends. That is a fact. Ella Fitzgerald and Marilyn Monroe did know each other. They were fond of each other. I wouldn't say they were friends in the way perhaps they put them in the book. Um, but they were. So this one I'll probably enjoy reading very, very much. It looks it looks like the sort of thing I'll enjoy. And I have a look at it. I can just read and enjoy it. Mistakes in that aren't going to annoy me. I will get annoyed with the enchanters because of the murder rubbish. I nearly swore then. Last one is a lovely book. Now, the next one is Marin Row by Eve Arnold with a forward by Angelica Houston. And it's this beautiful cloth bound book with this picture on. This is actually the third full book on Marilyn by Eve Arnold. Eve Arnold passed away a few years ago sadly um, and in here the text that's written by Eve Arnold is exactly the same as in the other two books which I've got on my shelves here and if you want a comparison let me know in the comments below and I will pull the books out and I will show you the three. I have a picture of the three of them on my Instagram but there are some new photos in here. We've got contact sheets. It's very nice. Um, but yeah, there are some lovely photos of Marilyn in here. Um, for some reason they used the same picture on the front as they used in uh, the original. The second edition, that's uh, John and Angelica Houston. That's a nice one there. Um, so, oh, it smells beautiful. Uh, I, this was what, uh, the original. This was one of the first hardbacks on Marilyn I got actually, and um, I really like it. Um, I love Eve, Ar Eve Arnold's work. It's beautiful. She was a brilliant photographer, and um, I had to add this new addition to my collection. Um, I don't need to read it because I know what it says. I probably will read it at some point because I reread my Marilyn books all the time. But yeah, this is beautiful. If you're a collector, it's really worth getting because. The pictures have been digitally enhanced and restored. They're not overdone like you see some people. Um, lovely. It's beautiful. So I had to add this to my collection. And um, there's another Marilyn book coming out fairly shortly by the same company. So it looks like it's going to be the same sort of quality, which I'm looking forward to. I think it's this month. Uh, but those are all the books I got across August and September. As of yet, I have not bought a single book in October go me. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. What book are you looking forward to me reading? I'm certainly looking forward to all the horror. I've got to put them all away now. Lucky me. And uh, I'll, I'll see you in the next video. So bye everybody. Bye.